many thanks for being here. Um, I'm, I'm going to present this book, which is a book on happiness. Uh, people usually get surprised to know that uh, an economist is writing about happiness, but uh, this has become a very important topic in economics uh, and in all social sciences. Um, it, the science of happiness developed in the past three decades thanks to the discovery of several reliable methods to measure happiness. Um, and these methods have been used uh, to answer questions about uh, what, what is making us happy or unhappy. Um, a typical question is uh, about money. Does money make us happier? This is the view which is typical in economics. Uh, more money, more happiness. Uh, this view is summarized uh, even uh, uh, better by Groucho Marx, who says there are many uh, things in life more important than money, but they are so expensive. And this is really the typical view in economics uh, uh, about money. Money is not an end, it's a mean to buy all that stuff that makes uh, uh, life easier, more uh, uh, pleasant. But the data seem to tell uh, a different story. Here you have uh, 50 years of American history summarized in two curves uh, from uh, uh, 46 uh, to 1996. The uh, increasing curve is GDP per head, which simply tells you that Americans have become much, had much more rich, much more affluent in the past 50 years. But uh, the decreasing curve is a share of Americans uh, reporting to be very happy, which has uh, decreased uh, substantially. So what uh, this uh, graph seems to tell is that while uh, the US were transforming in the paradise of uh, consumerism, the average American was feeling worse and worse. Uh, this kind of data are called subjective data on happiness because these are answers to questions uh, uh, on how people is uh, happy, how satisfied they are with their lives. And uh, then we use objective data as uh, uh, the spread of mental illnesses. And uh, they confirm, it, it is even worse the picture provided by this data. Uh, in the US there is an epidemic of uh, mental illnesses, especially anxiety and depression. And uh, another objective data is about suicides, which uh, in uh, fif over 15 years increased by one fourth. And then look at the spread of uh, psychiatric drugs an enormous increase uh, over uh, the past 50 year, uh, 15 years. Soaring addictions, this is probably the most impressive data. Um, there are more than two millions of uh, opioid addicts in the US, uh, 60,000 uh, deaths from uh, opioid overdoses come, came out from this number. Uh, 60,000 uh, is an enormous number, it's more than the uh, whole number of deaths uh, during the Vietnam War. This is the biggest American massacre uh, after the Second World War. Look at the trend of this uh, um, drug overdoses, an enormous increase across the past 15 years. But this is a phenomenon are not typical only of uh, the US. We find them also in developing countries, fast growing countries as in China, in the, during the 90s uh, and uh, the um, first part of the 2000s, um, which was a period of a very rapid economic growth in uh, China, 10% of uh, per capita GDP increase per year on average. And, uh, but average life satisfaction decreased by more than 7%. And if we look at the other very successful story among, uh, of growth among uh, de developing countries, which is India, the situation is, is even worse over the same period. So the examples uh, I brought uh, um, concern uh, 
probably the most celebrated cases of economic growth uh, all over the world. The US among the developed countries and China and India among the developing countries. But uh, rapid growth, growth seems to bring uh, disappointing effects on uh, people's happiness. In Europe, things have gone uh, a little better. This is the trend of life satisfaction, life satisfaction in Europe uh, since the early 70s uh, to, the, uh, to 2007. And it increased, even, even uh, if this increase was slight. So why all this happened? Economic growth brought us very important things, as uh, access to consumer goods, which are very strongly craved. Look at how happy is this uh, woman during, during the sales. These are not homeless, so they are waiting for uh, a new uh, iPhone. So why, uh, when we can satisfy these uh, so strong desires, we don't feel better? We also live longer lives. Uh, there are very important things that economic growth brought. Uh, access to education, but something seemed to have gone wrong from the point of view of happiness. At all ages, we have a problem, according to the data. So these are the questions. And uh, now we go to the answers. What uh, did we learn from happiness studies? What makes us happy? Does money matter? Yes, a little, not that much, and mostly at uh, low income levels. What, uh, at low income levels, more money makes some difference in happiness, uh, but the, the higher uh, mid income levels uh, doesn't make any difference anymore. Uh, being, uh, belonging to the middle class or a bit more to the middle class makes no difference uh, in practice in happiness. What really matters is the quality of uh, human relationships. This is the most important thing. There are many things that matter for happiness, but this is the most important one. So, uh, what drove the decline uh, uh, of uh, happiness in uh, the US, China, and India? These are the most striking examples of the so-called happiness paradox. Um, or Easterlin paradox, uh, named after the economists who first discovered it. Uh, economic growth had a positive impact on happiness, but this positive impact more, was more than offset by, by some uh, negative contributions to happiness. First of all, the decline of relationships, and then increasing social comparisons. What, uh, um, I'll, I'll clarify the concept of social comparisons through pictures. Look at this. Is that clear what the social comparison is? If it is not clear, this is going to be more intuitive. What, uh, <laughs> why the, does this uh, child ha has this gloomy glance? Because he's looking to a bigger ice cream. Or look at this. Sophia Loren, one of the most beautiful uh, women ever, but the gloomy glance is due to some <laughs> social comparison. Um, this picture is very interesting because uh, we are speaking of uh, one of the most beautiful women ever, but it shows uh, that even Sophia Loren uh, can envy something to, some, to something else, to someone else. There's no limit to social comparisons. Uh, you can always find someone who has something more than you. And uh, so social comparisons, the problem is that uh, when uh, people compare a lot to each other, this is a factor of the dissatisfaction. You can always find it. Having a lot can seem uh, uh, having a little if you compare to someone who has more. And then the other problem, uh, decline of relationships. In the US, one fourth of Americans uh, have no one to share uh, their confidences with. And this uh, share is one half if we um, don't consider family members. So this means that one fourth of Americans uh, um, speak about confidences only with their uh, relatives. 
uh, from 15 to 30 percent of the general population, loneliness has become a chronic state. Uh, 80 percent of uh, people under 18 years feel lonely, 40 percent of people under uh, 65 years feel lonely. Families have become increasingly unstable. Um, Americans marry less, divorce more, they live together less, they separate more. Uh, that's a society which developed an enormous difficulty uh, to build stable relationships. And then we have enormous uh, generational cleavages, very tense relationships between uh, um, kids and teens on one side and the adults world on the other. Trust diminished, as well as solidarity, honesty, social participation, civic engagement, uh, the quality and the quantity of relationships uh, among friends, family members, uh, neighbors, uh, it, this all uh, decreased. So, and in China, we find a similar situation. Despite the enormous differences among uh, the US and China, the pattern is very similar. The number of uh, solo households uh, doubled in just 10 years. Uh, between 1990 and 2007, married population decreased by 16%, uh, trust by 11%, associational activity by 20%, and engine figures are similar. Uh, what we observe in these countries is that uh, the problem is not economic growth. Growth had a positive impact on, uh, on happiness, uh, uh, but this uh, positive impact was more than off offset by the negative impact uh, of the increasing social comparisons, which became much more important, and uh, the, dec the decline in uh, social and uh, affective relationships. So it's a very similar story between, uh, among these three countries. Uh, also in China, we observe uh, an, an enormous increase, very, very sharp, of social comparisons. So the um, picture I depicted of, this, of uh, these countries is a picture of a very strong social crisis. People got, uh, over time, got poorer in uh, time, well-being, relationships, uh, and this is a long-term long trend. So these are very strong symptoms of a deep social crisis, but this country grows so quickly. So there's a contrast between social crisis on one side and economic dynamism on, on the other. And the interesting question is, uh, is there a relationship between social crisis and economic dynamism? And my answer is positive. This is based on the concept of defensive growth, Again, I'll try to be intuitive to make you understand what it is. Um, if we start from a situation of uh, loneliness or uh, uh, pollution, the, the degradation of the environment, uh, what can people do? People will try to make more money because money is a very good defense against the decline of relationship and of the environment. Uh, I'll, uh, make, I'll give you some example. Imagine that the city where you live in becomes too uh, dangerous to go out at night, or that your network of friends disappears. You call people and nobody has uh, time, and nobody wants to come out, so you have to spend your nights at home. And uh, in order to have uh, pleasant nights, uh, you fill up your home with all kinds of home entertainment. Home entertainment uh, is a costly and private good, uh, a livable city or a network of friends is a common good and they are free. So money substitutes for something which was free. Think of the elderly. When uh, our elderly are uh, sick and lonely now, we buy them uh, a caregiver. Before there was uh, a, net, um, a social fabric in the neighborhood who took care of them. Someone passed uh, to meet them, someone uh, did shopping for them, they were never alone. Now the social fabric in the neighborhoods doesn't exist anymore. We need money to buy the, care, the caregiver. Social fabric is free and is a common good. Uh, the caregiver is a private and costly good. 
think of uh, of childhood. Uh, my generation grew up in the streets. We spent all the afternoons of our uh, childhood uh, with our gang of friends in the streets. Uh, now no child does it anymore because cities have, have become dangerous, for, uh, especially for cars. Cars are an enormous problem for children. We used to pay, play soccer in the middle of the streets uh, because there were very few cars. When I was a child, now, of course, it has become impossible. And this uh, radical, radically changed uh, childhood. Uh, children grow up in, um, in their homes now. And they socialized uh, uh, through screens. We socialized with people. They socialized through screens. They know the world through screens. They, are, they have a very poor social experience uh, in their uh, childhood. And this made uh, childhood much more expensive because we need a lot, a lot of money for babysitters. We need a lot of money for toys who um, who feel their loneliness, uh, their empty lives, empty of relationships. Uh, toys and babysitters are private and costly goods. Uh, a livable city for, uh, for children is uh, common and uh, free goods. So again, these are all examples uh, of money which is really needed to substitute for uh, declining common goods. Uh, the, the most important common goods that we have are the uh, relationships and the environment. Uh, for the environment, the, the same thing holds. Th imagine that uh, if the lake or the sea close to your home uh, becomes too polluted to swim in, you can buy a ticket to, to a tropical resort. The, this is a private and costly good. Uh, the river and the lake uh, or the sea close to your home is a common and free good. So, in all these examples I'm giving, money really matters when uh, uh, what we have in common declines and the most important things we have in common are the environment and, and our relationships. All, all common goods provide goods and services that must be substituted uh, by market goods when, um, when they disappear. So money is really needed. This is the real function of money. Then we have uh, uh, mm, a fake function, which is the one pr uh, promised by advertising, which always sends an existential message. Um, if you feel distressed, if you feel excluded, if you uh, fear that uh, this society, uh, you're not a member of this society, when well, you can be reassured by uh, buying. Buying is uh, the reassurance for all your, of your fears of exclusion. Um, and of course, this is not true. Uh, um, but uh, in all the other examples that I gave you, uh, the money plays a, a concrete role. It's real. The power of money to substitute for common free goods which are declining. So, in order to buy more stuff, we need to work more and we need to compete more. And in this way, we increase GDP. We generate economic growth. Economic growth is, <laughs> economic growth is, is defined as the increase of GDP. But uh, when the economy grows, we pollute more and the environment uh, um, worsens. The quality of the environment gets worse. And, uh, and also relationships can get worse. We mm, work more, we taste, take less care of our relationships, we mm, use more your, our cars, we pollute more our cities. Uh, um, so relationships can worsen with economic growth. So we have an, a this feedback from the increase of GDP to worsening environment, worsening relationship. So this is a vicious circle. Uh, a vicious circle whose result is this, a world of private wealth and common poverty, which is a typical feature of the world uh, we built. Um, my idea is that uh, this 
common decline is uh, much stronger in those countries as uh, the US, Ch China and India and this is what drives people to a feverish hunt for money because money is re becomes really important so this is a part of the explanation uh, of why this country grows so quickly quicker than Europe, for, for instance. Data on Europe show that uh, the relational decline in Europe was uh, much more limited compared to these countries. And in many countries, uh, relationship uh, even slightly were uh, in, um, improved. Um, even if this improve, the improvement is very slight uh, and uh, it began to reverse uh, in in the first decades of the 2000s. This is the word we created, social comparisons. Social comparisons are the other side of the coin of declining relationships. If we look at individual data, what we find is that people with poorer relationships are more inclined to social comparisons, are more sensible to envy. Social comparisons is a form of social envy. And social envy develops uh, amidst loneliness, amidst uh, conflictual relationships. Those people with poor relationships are uh, more sensible to social comparisons. So this is why we observe uh, that increasing social comparisons and declining relationships always go together. In the, I'm referring to uh, the US, Ch China and India. This is an example of how costly it is to live in a society where relationships uh, uh, worsen. The share of the total labor force on the total labor force of so work supervisors and uh, guards, guards are police, correction officials and security personnel in general, um, was uh, in the American economy was 10.6% in uh, 1948. It remained stable until 1966 and then began to soar. In 1979 it was uh, already more than 13% and it was almost 18% in 2002. Uh, think of the, it's, this is an unbelievable number. It, almost one American out of uh, five works to control someone else. It's an enormous uh, cost for the American economy, which has no comparison in, uh, I'll show you, in any other economy. And uh, this is the, uh, the other face of this number. The US jail population increased from uh, 200,000 in uh, the 70s up to more than 2 million in the 2000s, which is an unprecedented incarceration rate. Uh, it seems that uh, in, in modern history it has been uh, um, only China during uh, the uh, Cultural Revolution and uh, the USSR during uh, the Stalin era had higher incarceration rates than the US now. Look at this. This is a share of work supervisors on the total labor force. The US score 15%. The smaller number is Italy, which, uh, which is about 3%. This is an enormous weight on uh, the American economy. It's one uh, work supervisor out of six workers. And, and uh, it's unparalleled in any other economy except the UK, the most Americanized country in, uh, in Europe. So to understand why relationships decline and uh, happiness declines, uh, we have uh, to look uh, at the role of, the, of materialistic values. This is a topic studied by um, social psychologists, which define materialism uh, like this, giving a high priority in life to extrinsic motivations, such as making money, uh, consumption, success, um, intrinsic motivations uh, uh, is, that, is that clear the concept? No, I'll define it. Um, 
I can work uh, f uh, for uh, money. Uh, money is an external motivation to my work. If I work for money, uh, my motivation is extrinsic. If I work because the work is interesting, this is uh, an internal motivation to my work, and it is defined as intrinsic. And uh, people uh, um, with high materialistic values give a high priority to extrinsic motivations and a low priority to intrinsic motivations in their life. This is um, um, the, order of the, the ordering of their priorities in life, what they prioritize in their choices. And uh, mm, the more materialistic uh, people are, and they're less happy they are. And they have uh, greater, uh, um, more frequent uh, negative emotions and less frequent positive emotions have a higher, much higher risk of mental illnesses uh, and uh, they are also unhealthier. For instance, materialistic people have a much higher risk of uh, cardiovascular disease than non-materialistic people. And moreover, they have worse relationships with other people um, because they are less generous, less empathic, less cooperative. They tend more to instrumental friendship, cynicism, distrustful of others. So, uh, having this kind of values, materialistic values, is not, is not a great deal. Not for those who embrace these values, not for those who, who surround the materialistic people, because those people have bad relationships. The problem is that materialism is soaring. In all these countries that I analyzed, 70% of Chinese people and 50% of Americans feel under a lot of pressure to be successful and make money. The percentage, uh, th these numbers are the result uh, uh, of an enormous increase in materialism across the past few decades. Uh, an, an increase in materialism which uh, began uh, in the 80s, was very strong in the 80s. Just an example, the percentage of university students who believe that an outstanding economic condition is an essential goal in, in life was 39% in uh, 1970 and 74% in 1995. An enormous increase, it doubled in just uh, 15 years, mm, 25 years, sorry. Uh, why materialism soared? Uh, all the studies on uh, advertising show that advertising has an enormous power to increase uh, materialistic values, uh, a power that we don't perceive. But it's, it is very strong, it has a very strong effect on adults and a stronger effect on uh, children. In the 1920s, uh, Charles Kettering, uh, the um, director of uh, research at General Motors, uh, he declared that the mission of business was the organized creation of dissatisfaction through marketing, which was at the beginning in the 1920s. Um, this vision has been embraced by marketers, fully embraced. Let's see what modern marketers say. This guy says, I'm an ad man, my mission is to make, to, to make you drool. I make sure you'll always be frustrated. In my job, nobody wants you to, your happiness because happy people don't buy. So, the creation of dissatisfaction is the basic principle of good advertising. As uh, stated by Nancy Shalek, uh, a famous advertising executive uh, American, uh, advertising at its best is making people feel that without their product, you're a loser. Um, marketing uh, explains much uh, of the differences in uh, the trends of materialism between Europe and the US because they are very different. Uh, materialism is decreasing in uh, many European countries uh, over the past few decades. Uh, 
but the advertising pressure in the US is four times uh, uh, the advertising pressure uh, in Europe. The per capita advertising expenditure in the US is four times the uh, European average. The, the effect, these effects on children are much stronger than uh, on adults and uh, marketers are perfectly aware of this. Look, the, the first part of the sentence, you just read it. Advertising at its best is making people feel that without their product, you're a loser. Kids are very sensitive to that. You open up emotional vulnerabilities and it is very easy to do with kids because they're the most emotionally vulnerable. But, uh, I find this sentence terrible. And look at this, there are only two ways to increase customers. Either you switch them to your brand or you grow uh, them from birth. When it comes to targeting, ki targeting kids, consumer, we at General Mills follow the Procter & Gamble model of uh, cradle to grave. We believe in getting them early and having them for life. They are perfectly aware uh, that they are generating materialism. And this is the result. In the 2000s, spending on advertising to children uh, was uh, 150 times uh, the amount spent in the 80s. Uh, and now, currently, the biggest share of the marketing uh, um, expenditure is targeting children and, kids and uh, teens. Uh, it, uh, they have become the main target of advertising uh, uh, and this generated a spread of materialism. 75% of American children want to get rich. Uh, this share is unparalleled in any other country over, over the world except India, where the share is the same. Children more exposed to advertising are more materialistic less happy and have poorer relationship, exactly as adults, but this impact is stronger. So, what should we do? Uh, I, uh, until now, I gave you the bad news. Now we go to the good news, because all this can be changed, and it is already changed, changing. There are many examples of uh, good practices. So the core of uh, this book is um, a policy agenda. What we should change in all these uh, fields of social life in order to, um, to, build a, to build a happier society, more connected, improving relationships. This is the goal. So let's begin with the easiest uh, uh, point, advertising. In Sweden, advertising tar targeting uh, children uh, under 12 uh, uh, is forbidden. You cannot advertise toys, for, in for instance, on TV. And uh, TV programs uh, uh, targeting children cannot be longer than half an hour per day. So the principle is that children do not, do not, ha do not have to spend their time uh, watching TV. They have to do uh, other things. So, what we could do is to, uh, there are many other uh, European countries uh, that have strong limitations to advertising targeting children. Um, it is just an example. It's a good example. We could ban uh, TV ads targeting children. We could reduce TV program uh, targeting kids. And we should, we should have it ex all advertising, even the advertising targeting adults, because advertising have very negative effects on uh, cultural and social life. Schools. What do we learn at schools? Uh, many important things which are uh, written in, in the programs and many other important things which are written in no program, uh, but are not less important. For instance, uh, um, when kids would, would go to school, they are six, and they usually have to, sta to stay sitting five hours per day. Um, 
the, the word to describe this is between uh, tor torture and maltreat them, choose the word that you prefer, because this is, incon this is inconsistent with uh, a kid well-being. A kid cannot be sit five hours per day and be happy. So the first message that I get is uh, you're not here to be happy. You're here to perform. Perform is something and being happy is something different. And they interiorize this message because uh, they are six. It's the, the, it, this is the first contact that we, they have uh, with a human institution. And this is the first uh, lecture. Performing, producing is something, having a good time is another thing. Um, the problem is that studies on this topic shows that happiness is, is the key to academic achievements. Happier students uh, um, have better results than uh, less happier students. So. Uh, the problem is that schools are a factory of anxiety. 55% of students are anxious even if they are well prepared. Two thirds of students feel stressed about poor grades and anxiety as uh, uh, claimed in the last uh, OECD report uh, on uh, schooling. Anxiety is uh, very bad for academic results. Then schools are schools of materialism. Uh, the message of schools is that uh, intrinsic motivations are not important, are not what matter. We then never say to students, uh, come to school because it will make you a better person, uh, will cause you to live uh, hap more happily. Uh, we say to them, come because you'll have a better job, you will avoid the social exclusion. These are all extrinsic motivations. Uh, and the implicit message is that uh, intrinsic motivations are unimportant. Uh, but the problem is that, uh, again, the uh, OECD shows uh, that, in uh, and many other studies, shows that uh, intrinsi intrinsically motivated students score higher in, uh, in tests. Intrinsic motivation is very important for academic achievements. And then we school teach relationships, uh, teach competition. The competition is uh, fostered in all ways in schooling. Competition among individuals. Uh, we don't usually uh, grades are individual. Uh, group works is uh, very poor. It, 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 there's a variability in this among countries. In Italy, for instance, it's, it's, it's very poor. Uh, but the underlying belief, why do they do that? The underlying belief is that competition raises standards. Because uh, the, um, the worst students uh, will try to keep up uh, with uh, the best students. So the idea is that the standard raises, uh, and this is a wrong idea. We know from the studies that uh, comparisons undermine self-esteem for the, uh, for the uh, students uh, um, which perform more poorly. And uh, they get trapped in a situation in which uh, uh, self uh, low self-esteem generates uh, poor performance, poor grades, uh, so they get trapped uh, uh, in, um, in poor performance uh, across all their uh, schooling career. Self-confidence and not pressure, not peer pressure is the key to learning, according to the studies. And, uh, and then schools teach that only cognitive intelligence is important. Emotional intelligence is unimportant. Um, but the problem is that studies show that 80% of successful uh, lives are explained by emotional intelligence and not by cognitive intelligence. Emotional intelligence seems to be much more important for flourishing, for living happily than uh, cognitive intelligence. Um, so this is a wrong idea. Where this uh, very wrong idea comes from? It comes out from uh, um, positivism. 
uh, positivism uh, during the, which developed uh, during the 19th century. The idea that uh, cognition, in order to be working, need to be free from emotions. Emotions are a disturbance for uh, cognition. Think just um, Sherlock Holmes, the typical, uh, he's the character uh, which best expresses this idea. No emotions, extremely cold. Rationality is the basis of knowledge. It not, must not be disturbed by emotions. But this is an idea of the 19th century. We now know that this was a wrong idea because emotions and cognitions uh, reinforce each other, they support each other. And people learn much better when they're happy, when they're interested in what uh, they study. Um, so it is not working. We teach that uh, uh, tests are, is what matter, the performance. But, uh, but studies show that the focus, the exclusive, obsessive focus of schooling on tests destroys uh, creativity, uh, critical and original thinking. Uh, um, so it doesn't work to for uh, learning what, what really matters, to create, to be innovative, uh, to, and uh, highly extensive uh, programs have a similar effect. This is a telephone uh, from 100 years ago, and this is a modern day telephone. Big difference, right? This is a car from 100 years ago, and this is a modern day car. This is a, class from, a classroom from 100 years ago, and this is a modern day classroom. Nothing changed. Why? So, it, it is the only thing that did not change over one century. Uh, and it is not working. It is based on uh, old and outmoded ideas. So, the bad news is that schooling is not working, but the good news is that we know what works. We know how schooling should be changed. Participatory teaching is a teaching practice which is based on students working in groups, on common projects and asking teachers questions. In this kind of teaching practice, the central relationship in the classroom is that between students, is that between students. But the uh, teaching practice to which more, uh, most schooling uh, use is vertical teaching. Uh, teachers lecture, ask students questions, uh, students uh, study textbooks, uh, uh, take notes, uh, and in this kind of teaching uh, the central relationship in the classroom is that between uh, uh, the teacher and the students. It is very different. And the, the point is that uh, uh, there's an enormous variability in teaching practices uh, uh, across different countries. Uh, so we can exploit this variability to understand what works, what are the effects of participatory teaching, uh, and uh, what are the effects of vertical teaching. Uh, there are countries, especially in uh, Northern Europe, uh, which uh, embraced decidedly the participatory teaching. Uh, much less uh, uh, across uh, southern European countries and eastern European countries. The most uh, comprehensive paper comparing participatory and uh, vertical teaching reaches this conclusion. Participatory teaching promotes uh, cooperation with other students and teachers, self-esteem, membership in association, social engagement, participation in civil society, and also uh, better academic results. Because, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Northern European countries usually score very high in those rankings with com which compare academic achievements across countries. Moreover, people are happier in countries where participatory teaching uh, prevailed. 
um, participatory teaching, in a way, is, um, um, is embedding principle of Montessori schooling in mainstream schooling. Montessori schooling was invented by Maria Montessori at the beginning of the 20th century, as these are the, its uh, characteristic. Uh, Multi-age classrooms, absence of grades and tests, individual and small group education in, in both academic and social skills, student chosen uh, work in long time blocks. And uh, if we compare Montessori schooling uh, um, to uh, uh, traditional schooling, we find that uh, Montessori children perform better on standardized uh, reading and math tests, even if they did never a test in their life, because in those schools there are no tests. They interact more positively in, uh, when they play, they're less conflictual, more cooperative. They show higher social cognition and control, greater concern uh, for fairness and justice, write more creatively and use more complex, uh, complex sentence structure, and select more positive responses, more cooperative responses to uh, social dilemma. So, uh, we know much about what we should do with schooling. Um, work experience, firms, organization, how the way we work. Look at this. This is uh, the trend uh, over uh, 30 years of uh, uh, work satisfaction, this violet, and th which is flat. And this is an index of uh, wages in the US. So, while the wages were increasing, uh, work satisfaction was not increasing. And the reason is explained by the studies on uh, the determinants of uh, job satisfaction. Job satisfaction increases with the quality of relationships on the job, which are very important, especially trust. Trusting uh, peers is very important, and, and also trusting managers. Uh, the perception of having control of in one, over one's work, the opportunity to express one's abilities, uh, the variety of tasks uh, carried out, uh, and well, also wage is important. The higher is wage, the higher uh, um, job satisfaction. But if you look at the list, the first four points are intrinsic motivations. The only extrinsic motivation is wage. So intrinsic motivations are very important in determining uh, how satisfied one is with his job. The problem is that this is a good... Uh, um, this gives you an idea of uh, how relationships are you, in, in many companies. And uh, so the problem is that uh, wages uh, might have increased, uh, but all that concerns intrinsic motivations have, have worsened. Worse relationships, stress, tensions, uh, um, boredom. And the result of all this is that uh, people perceive, in most countries, perceive decreasing discretion uh, on their jobs. And they perceive uh, that the cognitive uh, demand of their jobs is decreasing. Uh, a cognitive demand is uh, the opportunity to express one's abilities. Job low job satisfaction is becoming uh, an enormous problem. And look at this, uh, I find this impressive. Uh, this is the world, 2009-10, 2011-12. Uh, the share, and this is Europe. The, the share of workers which feel engaged with uh, their work in Europe is 14%. And the share of not those who are not engaged is uh, two-thirds. The share of actively disengaged is one out, five, out of five, which is bigger than the share of engaged people. So, 
this is the world of uh, disengaged uh, or even actively dis uh, disengaged people um, dissatisfaction with uh, one's job, stress, all these are uh, the features that characterize the work experience uh, across the Western world. So what should we do? We should improve uh, uh, the work experience by redesigning the content of work processes so to make them more interesting. There are interesting experiments of uh, job redesign, job rotation, which usually raise job satisfaction. We should improve the work experience by increasing the degree of discretion uh, and autonomy of workers. We should improve the work balance life, uh, increasing um, um, parental leaves, uh, leaves for uh, um, uh, studying, uh, making work hours more flexible, and especially we should reduce those aspects of work organization that produce stress, pressure, controls, incentives. Uh, the problem with this project is that economists uh, say that uh, this will uh, um, make us poor because uh, the price to be paid for economic uh, prosperity is Work, stress, work distress, uh, time pressure on the work, uh, bad, real difficult relationships, uh, um, tension, pressure. The, the side effect of this is that people will work better, will be more productive and we all be, will be richer. The problem is that this is a superstition because the evidence says that uh, happier people work better, not work not worse. We have an enormous uh, mounting evidence on this from uh, old studies in uh, sociology, psychology, economics, uh, experiments, case studies, they all reach the same conclusion. Happier people work better. So, um, we should take uh, in, uh, in the organization of work within companies, we should take uh, more care of intrinsic motivation. We should understand that people has also intrinsic uh, mot motives. They attach an intrinsic value all, uh, to their work. Not only an it's not just a way to get a wage. Um, incentives. Very, the, this culture of incentives which spread uh, within companies uh, um, or organizing all work aspects is uh, uh, producing um, perverse effects. Is raising, in many cases, it raises opportunistic behavior by workers uh, intuitively. If, the game, if we play uh, to guards and thieves, and you are the guard, I'll be the thief. Is that clear? Um, so, I'm not stating that uh, we should, uh, that companies should be organized without any incentives. Because we know from the determinants of job satisfaction that uh, extrinsic motives are important, wage is important, for instance. So, we should not eliminate all incentives, but we should overcome a culture that incentives are all the horizon of uh, uh, organization of work within companies. Cities. For 5,000 years, cities have been, uh, uh, have been conceived as a place for gathering people, for making people stay together. Uh, and it has always been like this. The social fabric in the cities uh, was created in the common spaces, square, streets, where people could... Over, the square was a symbol of uh, all this in Europe. Uh, uh, the square was a place where citizens of all ranks could meet. But uh, then cars arrived. And the function of building a social fabric of the common space was destroyed by cars. Because uh, when a city becomes, uh, when the common space, the streets and squares become uh, uh, noisy, polluted, people pass 
through the streets to go somewhere, they, uh, they become, they are no longer places where people uh, meet. Can, you can have a talk with a neighbor. Um, moreover, we move uh, uh, within the, our cars and where we are close within our cars, of course, we don't meet anyone. So, the problem is that uh, this situation where's uh, the relational quality within cities for all citizens, but especially for uh, children and the elderly, because uh, they need a social fabric at working distance for having relationships, and uh, cars made this existence impossible. So, um, this forced the elderly and children within their homes and uh, we invented uh, uh, youth loneliness and uh, the loneliness of elderly, which uh, these are the two categories I showed the, the, you the data, which are more exposed to the risk of uh, social isolation. One generation ago, 10 years old, uh, had more freedom than a teenager does today. This is uh, the conclusion of a British report uh, on the conditions of childhood, uh, and it is based on uh, this data. In a single generation, since the 70s, the radius of activity of children declined by 90%. The radius of activity is um, um, the area around home where uh, children are allowed to roam unsupervised and it declined by 90%. It's, it is the home now, the radius of activity in practice. Uh, children can no, can no longer move. From uh, in 40 years, in 30 years, between 1979 and 2001, the share of students walking to school decreased uh, from uh, 41 uh, to 13%. And this 13%, they walk to school accompanied by their parents. But the this 41%, they went to school, uh, they walked alone. The data from Europe are similar. And the consequences are, are terrible. An epidemic of obesity, of children obesity, which uh, is the result uh, of the fact that they, of their increasing sedentary life, uh, and mo most of them. More, more than this, more importantly, relational deprivation. The poverty of social experience uh, during childhood. Um, urbanists know perfectly what I'm, what I'm saying. Uh, where, they know that where cars are less dominant, uh, uh, people are happier and have better relationships. And they also know what kind of city works to build relationships and happy people. Cities should have high residential density. Uh, the, the kind of uh, um, low density city, uh, which is typical, for instance, of American suburbs, doesn't work for uh, building relationships. Um, mixed used, we must have a large typology, many types of activities, working, uh, residential, shopping, uh, they should be mixed within neighborhoods. Uh, parks, sports centers, neighborhoods should be walkable, uh, car traffic should be very strongly restricted. We have, and uh, Transport, transportation should be public, cycling should be uh, promoted in all ways. We have examples of cities working like this. If you go to Copenhagen or Amsterdam, what you will find is a city uh, radically close to private, private traffic. People move with public transport, uh, or, and a lot of uh, transport is on back, a lot of. The city is, uh, the organization of the city is all aimed at bikes and um, parks, pedestrian areas, and in this way, the brought again people in the streets, especially children and the elderly, in places with a very rigid uh, winter. Let's go to healthcare, <laughs> which is the last uh, topic. This is the share of uh, healthcare expenditure in the US um, as a share of GDP. 
It was uh, 13.8 in 2000s and uh, after about 10 years it was almost 18 percent. Think of this number because it is an astounding number. It means that, that uh, almost two dollars out of ten which are spent in US are spent in healthcare. We, which is a, a result of uh, this uh, enormous increase in just 10 years. Numbers in Europe are better but uh, not that much. The share of uh, healthcare spending on GDP is currently around 10% in all uh, European countries, so it's, it's about half of the American share. But it is increasing also in Europe, it has increased across uh, decades. Uh, here you have data from 2000s, but uh, it increased also across uh, uh, the decades before. And, um, The problem is that healthcare spend, expand, spending is out of control. It's unsustainable. It keeps on uh, increasing and uh, it will be uh, the universal uh, uh, healthcare systems in Europe uh, will be unsustainable uh, quickly. The, the basic principle of uh, universal healthcare is staying standard for all. But it's, it is hard to keep the same standard for, for all when the standard becomes so costly. Uh, why healthcare spending is, is unsustainable? Why it is out of control? And how to, to make it controllable? Let's start to answer this question. Is health improving? The um, intuitive answer that most people would give is yes, because they think of increasing longevity. And, uh, so we have these pictures of uh, happy old people, but it is a wrong answer. Look at this data. Life uh, is just an example in Italy, 13 years from 1995 to 2008. Life expectancy increased by four years. Great result. Four years, of, uh, um, four years more of average life in just 13 years. Wow, great deal. Look now at uh, uh, years of uh, um, healthy life. This increase in life expectancy justifies these uh, um, encouraging pictures of uh, happy elderly, but uh, healthy life uh, decreased. Five years less over the same period for men and nine years left less for women. It's an enormous decrease. So, um, Italy shows uh, that the gap between increasing longevity and decreasing healthy life is, is uh, widening. And the result, and this is not an Italian peculiarity, the problem is that these pictures should be substituted by these pictures because we are creating an army of chronically ill people. Those people which are in between uh, decreasing uh, healthy life uh, and increasing longevity. These are the data on uh, Europe and uh, the Italian pattern is replicated across many countries. So, this is what we created. And it is this army which is uh, making uh, health care spending uh, unsustainable. How, if you ask people how can health be improved in a country, they're very poor. Usually they will answer, let's spend more in health care and health will improve. And this is another wrong answer. Look at the relationship between, sorry, the slide is in Italian. Um, healthcare spending uh, per capita, pl private plus pl public, uh, longevity in years on the vertical axis. There's no relationship. There are countries like the US which spend much more than any other country and have a low longevity relative to other countries, countries which spend a 
little money on health care which have very high longevity. In general, there is no relationship. It is not true that uh, spending more on health care improves health. Why? Because uh, health care, according to epidemiological studies, is just one of the elements that affect uh, health. And the most important one is happiness. Happier people uh, live longer and healthier. Uh, I'll give you just an example. The Nun study, which is a very famous example. In the 30s, 1930s, a group of young nuns was asked to write short autobiographies. And these autobiographies have been studied by researchers 65 years later. Uh, um, they rated the happiness expressed in the autobiographies. And, uh, and then they looked for the nuns. Uh, of course, a lot of them were died, died in the meanwhile, but what they found was astonishing because almost all the nuns of the quarter that expressed the most positive emotion were, li were alive, still alive at the, at the age of 85, but only one third of the nuns that expressed, of the quarter that expressed the less positive emotion were still alive. So, the happiness expressed uh, 65 years uh, before b mm, predicts accurately the longevity of the nuns, even if longevity is not a good indicator of health. And this, kind of, this is just an example. It's very famous because it is easy to be told uh, and there are no confounding factors because uh, uh, all the nuns had the same lifestyle, uh, had ate similar things across their lives, uh, but uh, uh, it is plenty of this kind of studies made by epidemiologists. And uh, they use uh, me so many measures of happiness. The technique is always the same. They measure initial happiness uh, of, uh, in a sample of individuals, uh, and then they follow individuals across many years to see whether the initial happiness predicts uh, or not uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, the measures of the happiness which are used are depression and anxiety, sc scores, optimism, positive and negative effects, stress, ability to enjoy life, uh, to smile, hostile feelings, uh, cynicism, and re also reported happiness and life satisfaction. And people are followed for many years, sometimes for decades. These are samples uh, of uh, sometimes of tens of thousands of people and the results are always the same initial happiness predicts uh, uh, morbidity and mortality uh, more in detail initial happiness predicts uh, cardiovascular diseases cancer oh, cancer, speed of recovery after coronary bypass, probability of survival after stem, stem cell transplant, hypertension, female fertility, mortality among the chronically ill HIV uh, positives, um, diabetes, it predicts also immune competence, cardiovascular reactivity, and even one heal speed, healing speed. Why? because distress, dissatisfaction, uh, they deteriorate the immune and cardiovascular system. And moreover, uh, unhappier people have uh, an unhealthier lifestyles. They drink more, they smoke more, they eat worse food. Uh, and the other very important uh, risk uh, uh, factor, they call it psychological risk, risk factors, uh, is poor relationship. Uh, in the UK, they are perfectly aware of this. Uh, the, it was recently created uh, a ministry for loneliness in the UK. This is the minister. And uh, it was motivated by astounding estimates on the extent of loneliness in British society. Uh, one Brit out of six is uh, lonely. 200,000 elderly, elderly report uh, they have no conversation with anyone at least for one month. The problem is that uh, loneliness is driving healthcare out of control, especially because uh, elderly are, uh, the health of the elderly are, is extremely sensible to loneliness. It, uh, 
Loneliness uh, is a killer for them. Social isolation, social isolation uh, brings a greater risk of uh, ischemic heart disease, new heart attack in heart attack patients, coronary heart disease, cancer, even a common cold, which is counterintuitive because uh, it's a uh, contagious uh, illness. So socially isolated people should be at lower risk, not at higher risk. Um, all these relationships are much stronger on adults. The impact of uh, relational poverty, I mean, on their health. Older adults are at greater risk of uh, uh, development of cardiovascular diseases, uh, dementia, memory loss, Alzheimer uh, disease. This is Alois Alzheimer. <laughs> And, and they uh, at, are at greater risk of all cause mortality. Research, oh, this is very uh, important research because uh, they, in, um, they followed uh, people for 75 years. They monitored entire lives. Uh, they began uh, in uh, the early 30s to follow 70, um, 724, 724 males and uh, the conclusions of uh, this uh, 75 year study, which of course was led by generations of researchers, is that uh, uh, good relationships keep people happier and healthier. Happiness is love, full stop. Loneliness is a killer. These are the main conclusions by some of the directors of the study. Uh, so my conclusion is that is simply that uh, healthcare is the end station of the distress. All the problems of ill-being, unhappiness, before or later, turn to health health problems. So this is a very uh, important weight on uh, healthcare spending. And if we want to um, regain control on healthcare spending, we should take all uh, relational poverty. We should, especially, we should all the, all those policies that I mentioned before, which are aimed to build uh, a society of happier people, more connected. They would work also to decrease uh, spending on healthcare. Um, especially, prevention over the medium uh, term requires, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, requires tackling loneliness uh, uh, among elderly people. This is crucial. Um, and this would uh, uh, produce results uh, in a few years. And there is much we can do uh, to decrease the loneliness of the elderly, beginning with the way our cities are organized and managed and built. And uh, prevention over the very long term requires uh, tackling loneliness uh, of, uh, of the children. That's very important because we know from studies that lonely children, uh, um, they develop uh, um, more materialistic values and uh, attitudes uh, that uh, worsen their health across all their lives. And many thanks for your attention. This is again the cover of the book. Many thanks. <laughs>